Hi there, it's Lawrence Krauss, and I'm talking to you uh, on Critical Mass, my Substack site. Recently, I uh, put out a piece that asked uh, for re reader feedback or, or viewer feedback about what I might do for the site. And a lot of people talk to me about tutorials, uh, doing science tutorials, which is something I've done in the past uh, in different contexts. And I thought I'd try and do some regular video tutorials on science for the for the site since since uh, there's been, really was a, a consistent request from a lot of people and i've been thinking about doing two tutorials or really discussions about why i became a theoretical physicist namely the two demonstrations in undergraduate science that convinced me of the power of theoretical physics, the power of mathematics and the power of modeling the world and coming up with things that basically would never have expected by building a model that makes predictions that are amazing. And there are two simple, relatively simple examples that I know of that uh, at least that impacted upon me. The two things I learned as an undergraduate that made me go, wow. Modeling the world by mathematics can produce incredibly powerful results. So I want to talk about both of them. I'm going to do two videos. They 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 have to do with uh, a discovery by James Clerk Maxwell, basically the discovery of light, and something called the tennis racket theorem, which I learned as an undergraduate, and I often read incorrectly online as somehow a discovery of some Russian physicist or mathematician recently. It's been known for some time. It's a little more um, obscure, but I remember when I was an undergraduate how it impressed me and I'll, for reasons I'll talk to you about in that video. But in this video, I wanna talk about the power of what James Clerk Maxwell did to make a prediction. And I've talked about this in, in a general context in a variety of lectures, but I wanna put a little more meat on the bones here so you can see where where the power comes from and what amazed me. In any case, James Clerk Maxwell became famous as a, as a theoretical physicist. He was the greatest theoretical physicist of the 19th century for a variety of reasons, and he died very young, and he, nevertheless he produced an incredible amount of stuff. But he developed what are now called Maxwell's equations, four equations which codified the then all of the knowledge about electricity and magnetism that had been accumulated by experimentalists in the century before him, in particular by the experimentalist Michael Faraday, who before him was a generation before him was the greatest experimental physicist of the of of the of that time, the nineteenth century. In any case, Maxwell codified that knowledge and wrote it down in what we now know as four Maxwell's equations. And physics students put them on their T-shirts, and you can see these four equations. And underneath it often says, and let there be light. And I want to explain why that's the case. And it amazed me, and it still does, that such a simple result can be so powerful. And it changed our understanding of the world around us because it led to Einstein's theory of relativity and beyond. Anyway, I want to write down uh, Maxwell's equations in a kind of pictorial form because, um, because it's mathematics. There are four equations. And if I can just get it, there we go. Um, in, in uh, focus. So let me do the first one. The first one is an equation that basically says if I have an electric charge, it produces an electric field, and we can picture the field lines as going out radially from the electric charge. So electric field lines begin and end on a charge. I have positive charges, and if I have a positive charge, the field lines go outwards. For a negative charge, they come inwards. But electric fields always begin and end on a charge, and they go out radially from that charge. That's uh, And the number of field lines depends upon the magnitude, magnitude of the charge. That's the content of Maxwell's first equation. The second equation is, says that magnetism is quite different. Magnetic field lines don't begin or end on anything. They're always circles. There are no such things as magnetic charges. They're magnetic dipoles, like a, a little magnet with a north and south pole. And what that produces is a magnetic field line, which will go in a circle from the north pole to the south pole. But if I cut that magnet in two, there'll be two little magnets with north and south poles. You'll never get a single source of a magnetic field 
where there are field lines going out radially. That's the second equation of Maxwell's equations. The third equation, a little more subtle and complex, has to do with, uh, with uh, the discovery that Michael Faraday made, that, that magnetic fields can produce electric fields. And I've talked about the history of that, and I don't think I'll talk about it here. I want to just talk about the result. Well, <laughs> maybe I will talk about the experiment. Matt Faraday discovered by accident, when he was trying to bring magnets near a, a wire to see if a magnet could cause a current to flow, and he didn't get any results, he had an electromagnet and a nearby wire, and when he turned the electromagnetic off, electromagnet off, suddenly a current flowed in the wire, the other wire. When he turned the magnet on, so so the magnetic field would increase in, in, in the electromagnet, in a nearby wire, a current would flow. And what he learned then was that a changing magnetic field will cause electric fields to form nearby that can cause the currents to flow. And Maxwell quotified that by saying, look, if I have a surface, or, you know, bounded by a, by, a, by a circle, like I do here, Then there's a rule, and the rule is if there's a magnetic field piercing that circus, surface, and if, it, if the magnetic field changes in magnitude, then it'll cause an electric field to appear on this, on, on the, on this loop circle, boundary circle of that surface. And particularly, what Maxwell wrote down was that the strength of the electric field times the, the, the circumference of that, cir of that circle, 2 pi r, is equal, not just proportional, is equal to, and there's a minus sign here, but doesn't really matter. That just says what direction the electric field is in, minus the rate of change of the magnetic field piercing that circle. So if the magnetic field is there and not changing at all, there's no electric field around that circle. But if there's a magnetic field going through that surface and the strength of the magnetic field changes, the quicker it changes, the bigger the electric field going through that surface. That's Maxwell's third equation. And the fourth equation is a very similar equation with just some different numbers in it. It says if I have a, a surface with a circle bounding it, and I have an electric field piercing that surface, if the elect strength of the electric field changes, it'll produce a magnetic field on the surface, uh, on the circle boundary the boundary circle of that surface. So a changing electric field will produce a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field will produce an electric field. But the equation, Maxwell's fourth equation, is that the strength of the magnetic field going around that circle times the rate, the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, is now equal to the rate of change of the electric field piercing that circuit. But now the, the, the constant in front of it is not 1, but it's got two numbers in it, mu naught and epsilon naught. What are mu naught and epsilon naught? Mu naught tells you basically the strength of the magnetic field that comes from a magnet, and epsilon naught tells you the strength of the electric field that comes from a charge. Namely, epsilon naught tells you how many electric field lines come out of a charge of a given magnitude. It's a constant in nature that we can measure. It's the strength of electricity. Namely, if I have a charge of a of known magnitude, what's the strength of the electric field that it produces? Epsilon naught tells us that. I think it's called the vacuum permittivity, but I never remember those things. Mu naught says if I have two magnets, or if I have a magnet, how strong is the magnetic field far away from it? And one way to cause a magnet is to have a little current loop, an electromagnet. If I have a current going through it, how big a magnetic field will it produce? How, how strong a magnet will produce? That's I believe is called the permeability or one of them, maybe one is permittivity and one is permeability. I can never remember what the, the words are. But those two constants of nature, which I can measure in the laboratory, right? I can look at the strength of the magnetic force between two magnets and that basically tells me how strong the magnetic field is and the strength of that force, which I can measure by seeing how, how the magnets are repelled against each other or pulled to each other allows me to measure mu naught. And similarly, the strength of the repulsion between two electric charges 
will tell me epsilon naught. So those are Maxwell's four equations, and they codify everything we know about electromagnetism and everything that was known by the mid by the mid 1800s more or less about electromagnetism based on experiments that have been done by many people Faraday and Ampere and lots of other people and Coulomb and all uh, and uh, all sorts of physicists in the century before that so there are the equations now what do they imply if Maxwell had just written them down that would be nice but what he did was he realized they imply something I tried to draw it and it's hard and I don't know whether I did it. I know I didn't do a very good job, but let's just think about this case of a, of a, of a magnetic field and a surface and a, and a boundary circle here. And let's say I constantly change the strength of the magnetic field piercing that surface. Well, if I'm cha if that magnetic field is changing, then it produces an electric field on that loop. But if it's constantly changing, then the electric field going around that loop is constantly changing. But then I can draw a loop, which I tried to draw perpendicular to, the, to where that elect, electric field is pointing right here. And the loop, this loop is, is perpendicular to it here. So this electric field is piercing that surface. But if that electric field piercing that surface is constantly changing, then it produces a magnetic field on, that, on, the, loop, on the loop boundary of that surface. But if that electric field is constantly changing, then that magnetic field is constantly changing, and I can draw another surface at right angles to this loop, which is in the same plane as this loop, where now I have magnetic field around that, that circle, and, and that's non-zero, and that's constantly changing. So a constantly changing magnetic field produces a constantly changing electric field, which then produces a constantly changing magnetic field, and so on. The question is, so this, so this constantly changing magnetic field produces a disturbance in electric and magnetic fields that propagates outwards. And what Maxwell was able to show, in fact, Maxwell's equations very easily mathematically demonstrate that you produce a disturbance, which is a wave in electric and magnetic fields propagating out from that initial varying magnetic field. And the speed of that wave comes directly from Maxwell's equations, from these two equations, this equation and that equation, we can show mathematically, and I'm not going to show that right now, but you will take it for granted. But this is what amazed me, is a very simple mathematical demonstration shows that the speed of that wave depends upon the product of mu naught and epsilon naught, which appear as a product in the Maxwell's equations. And in particular, 1 over c squared, where c is the speed of that wave, is equal to mu naught epsilon naught. When one measures mu naught epsilon naught and takes the square root, one finds that the value is 1 over 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which tells us that the speed of that wave is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That comes just from measuring quantities in the laboratory, the strength of the electric force between two charges and the strength of the magnetic force between two magnets. When you measure them in laboratory, you find that the units are such that it comes up to 1 over 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that turns out to be the speed of this disturbance of electric and magnetic fields that start out by, by just varying a simple electric, a simple magnetic field. And Maxwell was no dummy. He realized right away that that was the measured speed of light. And he realized that light was therefore an electromagnetic wave. And I, I remember when I first, you do that derivation in a second year physics class in, in university and probably in Europe in high school, <laughs> but, um, or especially in Asia, probably in primary school. Uh, and, but what I found amazing was that these four equations, which just seems kind of abstract niceties, and they are, mathematically predict something. And the prediction is something that as a, as a, as a high school student or as a university student, I could actually calculate, and I could calculate that you'd predict to produce an electromagnetic wave, and the speed of that wave I could, I could calculate to be what is measured to be the speed of light. The incredible power for me, that was the first time as a, as a, as a, a physics student that I'd ever been able to calculate something interesting. Before that, it was inclined planes and pulleys and all sorts of stuff that are incredibly boring. But from first principles, using Maxwell's equations, 
I could calculate the speed of light. And in fact, Maxwell did calculate the speed of light. And that proved that light was an electromagnetic wave. And the power of that was incredibly important because there'd been a debate for 200 years before that, was light a wave or a particle? And if it was a wave, what was it a wave of? And what Maxwell showed was it was a wave of electric and magnetic fields. And as I've described elsewhere, that allowed Einstein, that motivated Einstein, that simple result that the speed of light is given by two fundamental constants of nature that you can measure, caused Einstein to develop the theory of relativity. And so that, re that was the first example for me that demonstrated the power of simple mathematics that can be played with and make predictions which are universal. I don't know if that was profound to you, but it was profound to me, and I thought I'd, I'd relate it to you now. Thanks.